Cool. So what we want to talk about now, if I can get my mouse to the right place, is uh, a couple of examples of team agreements um, because it, hopefully we'll have enough time. Is just to kind of show you some, and basically this is like random Googling, right? Like and things that, you know, and I kind of read through them and thought they were pretty good. There's kind of two different styles of doing this. Um, one is uh, you kind of, as a team, you sit down and write it together. Okay, that's kind of one way. Another way is to maybe together or maybe separately, you all go through and kind of answer various questions in the team agreement. Um, and then come back together and get to some sort of consensus about the individual pieces. So it's kind of like a stylistic thing. This is the latter, where it's it's not actually a team agreement. It's one where like a way to collect the information that you want to put into the team agreement. So I hopefully remember from last time, we've got some visiony stuff, right? Then and visiony stuff should be things that are visionary. Okay, so they should be you know things that have. Um, some some measure of like reach, right? Uh, you know, so think like that. Um, and then I usually also have something like goals, uh, or sorry, um, values. And values might be things like uh, everything we build must be open source. Um, but again, kind of aspirational. Um, you know, another example I was just getting from DU, right? So like DU as students, right? One of the values is um, being, uh, you know, kind of honest in your work, not cheating. Okay, um, so just kind of some more examples. One of the things that I wanted to point out here is that these are often written um, kind of at the organizational level, and this is kind of like general stuff. Um, and that's usually okay, because what it does is it allows you to go from team to team and have some of the core components be the same. And, you know, so you may have some differences within the individual team and it's things you want to think about, but you'll often get some boilerplate as well. So I just wanted to kind of give some example, and obviously we'll post the slides afterwards if you want to look at it in more detail. But as you can kind of see in this one, right, each time they're kind of saying, put in some of these things, what are my strengths, okay? Um, and this is where, uh, if you get interested in this, uh, BU actually has a fair number of faculty members who are uh, very, you know, uh, whatever their research areas is kind of team dynamics. Um, and they do research into these kinds of things and why they work and how they work and all that stuff. And so that might be worthwhile to take a look at their stuff. You know, see me, I can probably follow up and get you some more information. Um, I'm giving you kind of the, the learnings, you know, 100 foot view, you know, that will help you get by. Um, but, you know, it certainly won't qualify you for doing research into team dynamics. Let's put that way. Um, all right, so as you can see, kind of more of the same. Then this is one of the huge challenges is how do we get everybody in the same place at the same time? Uh, you know, with all of you, it'll be, you know, because you all have different classes, right? And all that stuff, which makes things very difficult. So there's a lot of tools on the internet now to try to solve this. Uh, one is like, what is good, for example. And then, yeah, so the last thing I really want to show you here is that most of the time you will literally sign one of these documents. Anybody have an idea about why they have you literally sign it, like with pen? Theories? Any? Is this like a psychological thing? Like, they just think it's gone, so they don't want out the board. Exactly. That is 100% the reason. So, you know. The, the saying here, this is an official contract, all this stuff. Eh, okay, like from a legal perspective, but psychologically, you are 100% correct. Whenever you sign something, it makes you uh, like kind of value the content of it more. Um, it is not uncommon, for example, for professors to require students to sign a syllabus in the same way. Like in the first class, I talked about that being kind of like a contract. Same idea. Uh, so it does have a strong psychological effect. And I strongly recommend if you ever are leading a team and you want to set up a structure like this, get physical signatures because it will help actually, you know, make it real. All right, so I just had another little example which kind of takes a different perspective, which is kind of like this is one that's already kind of done, right? Um, and so 
this might have been the output of a collective team or whatever to actually come up with it, or maybe this is actually a, uh, an organization that trains people in uh, running projects. So this is probably their proposed one. You can see there's like book references. Um, but it's kind of the idea. I just wanted to kind of give you some, some other samples, um, you know, to help you think through it. Um, because I think the next thing we want to do is the actual assignment. All right, and one last thing. I think in summary, has anybody here seen uh, Bill and Ted's excellent adventure? Raise your hands, please. Uh, it's uh, about the same ratio as my last class when I brought this up. Uh, it is an awesome movie. Um, but there's a quote in it where, where like there's kind of a slogan that two main characters have, which is be excellent to each other. And all of this kind of can be summarized in that, right? Is that, you know, if you want to be a good teammate, if you want to have a good team, be excellent to each other. And usually it will work out pretty well. Um, okay, so here's the assignment. All right, so what I would like to do is pair up, okay? And I'm gonna set the pairings because I'm a big jerk. Um, so how about you two, and then you two, and then you two, and then you two, and two, and two, et cetera. And you two, let's see. All right, so you two, and then you two, and then you two, and you two, and then how about and you two, and then you two, and then you two. Uh, all right. Not allowed to have odd numbers in the class. All right, so on Facebook, there is an assignment which has a PDF, um, which in retrospect, I could have done slightly differently, but there's a link in the PDF to a Google Doc. Go to that Google Doc, do a file copy, uh, make your own version. Then when you're done, actually, you could do it three if you want to, I think I set it up to be three. Um, when you're done, uh, file save as PDF, upload it to Gradescope. So we can talk about it. Uh, Y'all have a computer? No? Okay. I was like, wait, what? My, um, yeah, my computer is not. That's cool. Um, why don't we change the group then? Do you have a computer? No? All right. Um, so why don't the four of you work together uh, and you can do the type of piece? I don't know All right. Is anybody else without computer? I would like coffee. Let me have coffee. Um, I don't know what that is. Oh, sorry, I thought I said this is the point. Okay, so you're a software engineering team at a video game company. You're going to build an MMO for RPG. Does anybody know what MMO for RPG stands for? All right, so massively multiplayer online role playing game. Can you give me an example? Somebody else. World of Warcraft is the classic that everyone usually comes up with. There's actually a whole bunch of text-based ones from many years before that that not many people play anymore, uh, but they're really the original origin. Um, so that's just the premise. I would like to point out um, there is a common conceit, stereotype, of people who work in the gaming industry that uh, they are a bunch of cowboys. They don't follow any process. They just do whatever they want. Um, and so that's what the joke's about. All right, so I'm gonna give you a little bit of time to do it. Let me know when you're done. Uh, and the only other thing, sorry, was one of them has an NA on it. It's because I don't want you to do that one, okay? Like just skip it. But I wanted to put it in there for completeness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can do collaborative or one of you type or whatever you want to do. Please do it as a group submission. Okay, you should be able to put multiple people's name on one submission. 
That way, when we review them, it's just I don't keep opening the, the same one again. Okay. <laughs> And then trying to find the right window here. The computer is also on the wrong side, which is complex. Uh, let's see. Oh, I had it open, but I don't see it. And then it was which one again? Uh, like contextualizer. Let me just uh, move this over here so you can find it. All right, hello everyone. It's a pleasure to be back with you all. Well, I'm not sure what that was, but uh, I guess uh, I guess that means I'm supposed to start. So I just want to talk to you a little about contextualizing case studies. So we're going to be talking a little bit about the history of ethics and responsible computing, and some of the case studies that all of you looked at. It was a real treat to read through a lot of what you had. So first off, you know, this is just a slide from last time, again, reminding us of what ethics and responsible computing actually is. So it's the tools, habits, and practices that help one to make responsible decisions with computing, right? And if we think about all the different kinds of products that there can possibly be, all the kind of different ranges of technology, there's a, a vast wide variety of things that can use computers these days. And so any, anytime we have one of those, we're talking about this particular thing. I would say, especially when we're having technology make any kind of decision on its own, whether that's through some sort of model or some other means. So just take you through a little bit of the history. So I, I'm sorry in the 1980s, we could start earlier, but I think it's a good, it's a good frame of reference for us, especially since you know, it's about 40 years ago. And one of the reasons why I start there with the ethics and responsible computing conversation is because in the 80s, a lot of the issues that people were really concerned about were kind of, uh, were especially related to weapon, Right, like a defense systems, or thinking of things like NORAD, is actually very kind of a, especially kind of the end of the Cold War. People are very concerned about the their systems and kind of national actors hacking into them and whatnot. And part of the reason for that was just because most people didn't have access to computer systems. Right, if we're having, if we're just thinking back to where those were actually implemented, and because of the sheer size of them. It's going to be mainly universities and governmental entities that even have access to computers in the first place. But in the 1990s is when we start to get things like the personal computer, right? That's when people start to have them, start to have access to them, you know, uh, really janky, of course, by today's standards, but really revolutionary kind of compared to anything that came before because it was something that a regular person could access. And a lot of the issues around this time were actually related to what does it mean to have a digital object? What does it mean to own a digital object? Which is why I have a, the Napster logo here, because with something like music, it's, it can be a little confusing of why would you buy a CD if you can download something for free? We're actually seeing similar issues today with things like NFTs. Of What does it mean to have an ownership of a digital object? And if you want to talk about that at some point, we definitely can. But there's no infrastructure even like NFTs to implement something like that. So there's lots of digital rights stuff, all that sorts of things that can be going on in the 90s. Then in the 2000s, we start to get the things like the first iPhone. I actually owned you know, the iPhone when it came out. It's, uh, it's kind of weird to think about now the kind of changes that I've gone through the design, but it was really revolutionary. There wasn't anything quite like it before. And you know, to have a phone that's mostly a screen, we kind of take for granted now, but that's not the way things were designed before. You also have something like Facebook coming out, and Facebook had an interesting rollout where they chose to only be able to give it access to people who had a .edu address, so basically college students. This gave it a kind of exclusivity, and because of that, it was desirable. You can also think of something like Gmail, for instance. Back in the day, you used to have to be invited by a current Gmail user into their beta, so to speak, in order to get a Gmail address, which made it desirable. 
So we're thinking about rollouts of products at this time, in order to get people into it, they entice people by actually having it be scarce, right? Not anyone could sign up for it. And which is of course an interesting choice. In the 2010s, we start to get this thing, which uh, is usually called a ubiquitous computing, which is a fancy way of saying computers are everywhere, right? I have a computer sitting in my pocket right now that I'm just not using, right? I'm using a different computer to give the presentation. And because of that, you know, you can have things like smart fridges or even a, I don't know, smart garages, all, all these sorts of things that are kind of being rolled out at, you know, record pace, basically. Anything that you can put a microchip in, people start to until, of course, microchip shortage and all that. But um, this leads to a lot of different implications, I think, for society. So one of the things that actually goes on is, you know, we have this thing called misinformation. But one of the other things that we often don't think about is that because people can actively videotape things, right, like things that are going on in their daily lives, that's actually when you start to get records of, say, police brutality and things like that. That's why it starts to become part of the awareness that people have. It's just because anyone can record it. Anyone with a phone can kind of look at an abuse and say, like, hey, this is going on. You can post on social media. It can go viral. So this kind of changes the way that society works as a whole. And finally, we get to the 2020s. Most of us are very familiar with Zoom, unfortunately, because of you know, COVID-19, right? But people interacting mainly virtually. It's great to be here with you all, all of you. I had to lecture a few times uh, virtually. It's definitely not as fun. And uh, yeah, some other things that are coming on. Cryptocurrency has obviously came up before this, but they're starting to enter more in the mainstream. You start to see in the news now. But they're a big part of what's called this thing called Web 3.0, which is a kind of an idea once to have in your back of your mind of a, a decentralized autonomous system that are essentially permissionless. Anyone can use them. There's certain parameters around, you know, how exactly you can gain access to the system. But people are actively trying to build something now called an, an Internet of Things, and I think it's one of the new pioneering era, areas which all of you should at least be aware of, even if it's not something you tend to work on. So, what kind of drives these changes in ERC? I'm going to argue that there are three. So, there's culture. There's going to be private sector, you know, businesses, things like that, and then finally private public sectors, which is like the government. So culture, what are we talking about? One of the reasons why I started with the 1980s is because of this thing called hacker culture, right? So hacker culture is basically, you know, people being able to get access to these systems, maybe even not able to get access to government systems, but usually individuals kind of acting alone who have some sort of, you know, super special skills that they're able to use to get into things which they shouldn't be able to get into. And actually being here in Boston, this hacker culture is actually pretty local, especially to a place like MIT. So for instance, there's this person, Marvin Minsky, who had this idea of create first, ask questions later. This thing, which is part of, part of a broader framework called creative chaos, right? Which is just see what happens, right? Just go forward. It doesn't really matter. Just break things. Just go for it. That was kind of the ethos that they had in the 80s. Also, there's this kind of distinction that was made between so-called white hats and black hats, which was how do those hackers kind of use their skills? So for instance, there was a, a hack just uh, I don't know, a few months ago or so of a big crypto network called Polygon, but the hacker turned out to be a white hat and said, okay, I stole all this money, but I'm just gonna return it, just exposing the bug, right? So what people use their skills to do kind of differentiates them on this kind of an ethical framework basis, right? Of are they doing good stuff? Are they doing bad stuff? Are they uh, so? For instance, there's actually lots of how would you would call them like international cartels of hackers that kind of hold up businesses. So they'll take control of somebody's database and they'll encrypt it, and then they'll ransom it back to the company, and they'll threaten to destroy it. And those would be an example of black hats. So some earlier examples of this sort of thing is, for instance, these two brothers in Pakistan. Yep. Is there an updated version? Yeah, yeah. So this is actually that's actually a really good question. Part of the reason why I'm using the kind of anachronistic terms is to kind of highlight something like I'm particular. I'm really glad you brought it up. Uh, it's actually something that one of the other professors, Eva Tenmer, has talked about. Um, it's probably why we have it in quotes. If people don't use that terminology, I think, very much anymore. But if you're going to go back and look at the history, it's unfortunately going to be all over the place. So, sorry to say. 
Any other questions? Okay. So um, in 1986, there was a couple of brothers in Pakistan who would bootleg software. And what they would do is when they would sell people this bootleg software, they would actually load it with viruses and give it to the people that were trying to buy the bootleg software. They did this specifically because they wanted to punish the people who were trying to buy bootleg software. So there's a kind of vindictiveness to their activity, which I think is relevant to how they saw their own activity. In a similar way, there is a, there's a PhD student at MIT, Morris, who developed the very first worm. And basically, they're, you know, mostly university systems were all connected to each other. And he decided to create something as a kind of experiment. But unfortunately, because he had bad code, it was actually too successful. It was supposed to replicate itself just a few times and then stop. But it replicated itself way more than it was supposed to. And it ended up really infecting all of these really important systems, was completely everywhere. And when Morris was kind of found out, he kind of did like this aw shucks routine, like that's not what it was supposed to do. But the fact that he attempted to do something like that, and again, because of the way his code worked and operated the way he intended, it was far more successful as a worm than it might have been otherwise. And uh, there was some links here if you want to see future that. But one of the important parts of this is, as I'm trying to get across, is that there are, without computers, there are no computer viruses, right? That there's new problems that come about because of the technology that's involved specifically. But this is something that is raised because of that. So one of the core issues here is basically about can technology solve our, all of our problems? And this is related to my own research on techno utopianism. And if we think of something like the metaverse, part of the reason why some people are really for that idea is they have this thing called, you know, if you have an avatar, you can technically make an avatar however you want, right? And so some people idealize that, that you can be anything, right? You can be kind of unhindered, unhindered by sex, race, and gender. But the reality is that people, even in a digital space, tend to judge avatars based on their characteristics. So for instance, one example is that people tend to trust or give more authority to people who are tall. And maybe that has to do with people being a little physically imposing, but this also extends to avatar life. So those kinds of kind of innate biases that we have kind of still come out even in that space. Next is that most, we kind of see data as like the most objective way to represent life and everything. But as we kind of talked about last week, sometimes that data has biases of its own. There could be historical problems that are going into it, but it doesn't always get at what it's supposed to. And then finally, um, you know, if you really are for this kind of idea, you'll think, well, if we just keep making more technology, we'll eventually be able to solve all of our problems. But as I just stated, every time you create a technology, it's going to have its own issues, right? So you have to kind of use tech to solve tech, which is like, I don't know, I guess it keeps us employed, which is good. So finally, uh, the private sector, you know, so Google had this kind of famous thing where they said, uh, you know, just don't be evil, right? That was kind of their, their mantra for a while. And they, they later sort of removed that. And that's, I think, an interesting fact in itself. But I think part of the problem for them actually had to do with retrofitting, right? Which is that they only thought of their business model after they had a technology, right? They, they weren't thinking about how do we make this a sustainable enterprise, but rather after the way, after they had a really powerful tool, they had to figure out how to make money from it. And so we ended up in this sort of advertising world when there were probably other ways to do that. And because of that, there's lots of business incentives, I think, get in the way of doing ERC for the most part. So I think as you're saying, right, like it's, it can be really easy to say that you want to put ERC ahead of business, but if business is good, that can be really, really challenging. And so thinking about how you're going to actually make money, I think especially even now in these sorts of things is a really important part of developing technology today. Because if you don't think about it now, then you might get into a situation in which it doesn't, it kind of like gets past you, right? Or you're beholden to someone else who is controlling the purse. So in the public sector, we have things like Senate hearings. So for instance, uh, did anyone here have a chance to see Mark Zuckerberg go before Congress testify about Facebook? Yeah. 
So one of the interesting, I think, there is it, it was really clear that the Congress people didn't really understand what Facebook was, right? I wouldn't even say that Facebook is a particularly complicated technology, right? I mean, you post pictures, you share sizes, statuses, you like people's photos, right? But, uh, you know, there's questions like, they're asking Mark Zuckerberg, oh, how do you make money? And he's like, we run ads, right? It's, they didn't really get at anything which I think is important. And not only that, you have people who maybe don't quite understand what things are going on. Congress people tend to be a bit older. But it could also be the case that those people don't necessarily want to regulate or because of the worry about disrupting economic growth. If you think about, especially over the past couple of years, the industries that have really been booming have all been related to tech. So you might not necessarily want to stop that, especially if you're thinking about competition with other countries. For instance, uh, a few people noted some stuff about uh, Chinese telecom companies being banned in the US potentially. All that's related to the same sort of stuff. It's kind of nation versus nation competition. And finally, uh, regulation and jurisdiction are both difficult to sort of codify. And there's a couple of reasons for this. First off, regulation in itself is always going to be outpaced by technological change. So if I make a bill to regulate MP3 players, but nobody owns an MP3 player, well, then it's kind of irrelevant, right? Like the, the law doesn't actually matter. You can say that some other new technology that's completely different. This is an MP4 player, not an, you know, not an MP3 player, or it's an MP5 player or whatever. And finally, jurisdiction is really thorny because say if you have someone in Turkey who, I don't know, gets censored by Twitter or something like that because of their comments, how does that relate to the way that their, their governments are related to each other? You have an American company that's involved in the discourse that's taking place for other people. Do you have localized teams at that point? Uh, if this sort of international implications can get very complicated very quickly. And if you could think that regulation is hard at a national level and at an international level, it's gonna be even slower. So who's responsible? And this is actually a quote from the 90s uh, and it's purposely old because a lot hasn't changed. So this is from Johnson and Nissenbaum said, codes of ethics must be promulgated for the various types of computer networks establishing which standards of care should be exercised by operators or providers of computer equipment, networks, and services. Moreover, it is not yet apparent whether such standards will be established by private groups or public groups or in their absence by state or federal law. And I think this is still sort of true today. It's not, not really clear who should be stepping in on the forefront. Should it be businesses leading this venture and kind of deciding the rules on their own? Should the public sector be stepping in? How would they actually step in if they don't actually understand what's going on for the most part? Should it be university led? All of this is still kind of up in the air. And so because of that, I think it's really important for all of you to be thinking about these things yourselves, right? How do you take responsibility for the kinds of products that you are developing? How do you make those kind of in accordance with your own principles? and to make principled products. So uh, in terms of the case studies that, that all of you picked, um, I think your class is gonna be in blue. Uh, there's another class that we worked with as well that had similar assignments. Almost everyone picked uh, actually uh, either the dark UX patterns or medical risk implants, which is I think really interesting to see. I think uh, in terms of talking about UI and stuff like that, that's something that almost every, everything has, which is really important. If you're trying to say directly manipulate people, that sort of stuff. I think this is probably worse about five or 10 years ago, but it's still something that, that can happen today with people, you know, trying to manipulate other people and making choices they don't necessarily want to make. Uh, almost no one was interested in the kind of abusive workplace, but I think that it is important to note that how you and your team work together and understanding those dynamics is going to be a big part of your project. So making that as healthy as possible is going to be really, really crucial. So in terms of the contributed case studies, I actually kind of compiled a list of all the different ones that are here. Don't, we aren't going to go through all of them, but I wanted to notice, wanted to touch on at least a, a few different things. Um, multiple people, for instance, uh, uploaded stuff on deepfakes, which I think is a very interesting technology in part because they're so easy to use. And because of that, it makes it really difficult to stop, right? So if you have someone who developed something like that, and then, uh, so for instance, uh, one of the creators of this technology kind of is like, oh, we need to do something about this to kind of stop it. 
but it's already the cat story already is out of the bag, right? And people will do kind of I don't know personal projects of questionable validity just because they can, and that's I think especially true with something like deepfake. A lot of people also were very interested in things like self-driving cars, like how do those work? There are different issues going on with them. We'll talk about a story with those in just a second. And kind of everything under the sun. But this kind of goes back to what I said earlier of the kind of technological issues that we're experiencing today cover everything from medicine to you know fintech, finance, to the metaverse, social media. It's just a wide variety of things. And so the to trying to give particular advice on a any single technology is going to be difficult, but by looking at case studies, we can see the sorts of problems I think come up over and over again. So in order to do that, have kind of a framework of questions to kind of help with that. And these are kind of similar to the ones all of you went over. So first, we always want to think about what's the actual technology involved, right? And what's the primary use case of this technology? And you may be thinking, uh, like, why talk about the use case? Shouldn't the use case be really obvious? But it's actually really important to understand if a technology is working as it's supposed to. So for instance, there's a case uh, just this week of Tesla. And the BBC ran this article saying that Tesla cars were rolling through stop signs. And my first thought when I saw the headline was, oh, like they're rolling through stop signs because it's machine learning. Machine learning is learning from flawed human drivers. <laughs> you know, because every human driver does not stop the stop sign, right? They just kind of roll through it. But it turns out that this rolling stop is actually explicitly programmed into the Tesla vehicle. So they designed it so that it rolls through, right? And so if we're thinking about kind of unsupervised driving, which I think is the ultimate goal of these, then it's not even operating in, in accordance with the law, right? It doesn't even know base stop sign, which makes it a little questionable. But knowing whether that's a, a consequence of the programming of the machine learning or some other choice, I think is crucial for kind of analyzing it from an ethical perspective. So if it may also be interesting to think about, well, how did we learn about this particular issue? Was it a reporter that found it? Was it someone on the team who thought about this? Was it someone else who kind of brought this up? Because uh, you know, who discovered it can actually affect how somebody handles a given issue. If there's something wrong at Facebook and it's something that's uncovered, maybe it's internal, maybe it's not. I, I do know people who work at a lot of big tech companies and how they're able to handle some of that stuff's gonna look very different depending on whether it makes the news or not. Next, uh, how did the creators of the technology actually handle it once they knew about it? Did they do anything about it? In the case of Tesla, again, what the really funny part was they're like, no, no, this is working as intended. It's, it's supposed to work. We're, everyone knows that stop signs are just a suggestion. So if there weren't any steps taken, you can always be thinking about how what steps you might have taken if you're on that team. And then finally, what sorts of lessons can we learn about your, your own technology? And it was great to see many of you take that on in your own projects. So I think uh, next week, I believe, um, you're going to be doing this thing called the project assessment. And what that's supposed to do is it's going to be a little bit like the case study assessment, but for your own project, right, about the product you're creating. So there's going to be a kind of a different varieties of questions. The first set of questions is actually going to be about you and your team, right? What sorts of perspectives do you have? Does your team have any blind spots that you think maybe other things that you should be considering based on what your product does? Like who you are is going to be an inevitable part of the kind of technology design. Next, what's the kind of benefit? that you're trying to do with your, with your product? How is it supposed to work? How will you know if it actually does that? Does it have any risks? These, these are the sorts of things we want you to be thinking about now so that as you run into problems and try to make the code work, it, you can kind of match this up hopefully at a later point and see is this benefit really coming along as it's supposed to. Next, uh, how will customers pay for your product? Uh, it's actually something, again, I've been talking with another professor, Zebra Kramer, about because oftentimes we don't think about how someone's going to pay for something later, right? We're, we're here to en do engineering work, to code, not to do business, but business is kind of an inevitable part of technology these days. So we have to be thinking about that ahead of time. So that, again, we're not kind of at the mercy of, I don't know, obesity in the future. 
And then finally, what control do you intend to have once your product is in the customer's hands? And I mentioned this specifically because most things these days are designed with some sort of super admin power. There was a case in which Apple refused to allow the FBI to kind of spy on people's software. And one of the reasons why they suggested that, or I mean, they refused that, which I think is very principled in one sense. But the fact that they have the super admin power to take over somebody's phone at any point in time is a design choice, right? I think uh, Langdon mentioned earlier uh, in our earlier class that Intel has something similar with their computer chips. So having that kind of power is something that in the problem. It is, is a part of the product kind of going forward. So do you intend to have things like that? Do you not? Do you want to have it be standalone? All that sort of stuff actually matters and really impacts how things come across in the real world. Yeah. And yeah, so you'll do one of these now and you might do one again later, but just uh, designed to help you kind of get going and start to thinking about these sorts of things. Again, as if your product is really going to be going to market. And the more seriously you take that, I think it'll benefit you in the long run as well. Just, just to be clear, mm -hmm. the expectation is that all of these projects are going to go to market. So um, on the flip side, most of them are for like nonprofits and social good and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So hopefully they have less ethical challenges than Facebook. But you never know. It is kind of interesting. Uh, you know, I bring up United Way as a regular example. Well, that's all. But if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to fill them. All right, cool. Uh, thanks so much again. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, so basically, you know, we're going to do this assessment. This is the first time we're kind of trying to do this. So we're going to do this early project assessment on your project. And then maybe towards the end, kind of like try to recap a little bit more about like, okay, what did you learn along the way about the project? And, you know, and how does that, you know, potentially validate or invalidate some of your ethical ideas uh, at the beginning. So, all right, I think that's it. Uh, have a lovely rest of your evening and potentially a day off tomorrow. We'll see. <laughs>